Hi everyone, uh, welcome back to episode three of uh, my Stuart's vlog. Um, last time we talked about the first few years of Charles I's reign and how that ended uh, in 1629 with the start of personal rule. Um, and in this episode, we're going to think about uh, that period of personal rule and how the themes uh, of money and religion and of power and control, I guess, continue to be themes during uh, the time when Charles is running the country by himself. But first thing to say is that personal rule was not um, an unknown thing in, in England at this time. The different, in fact, there had been uh, personal rules of, of similar sort of lengths uh, in the not too distant past. But the difference with Charles I was that he seemed to have the intention of never calling Parliament again, whereas personal rules in the past have been at times uh, when there had been no need to call Parliament in the past. And the second thing to say is that actually Charles um, acquits himself in some ways relatively well during the period of personal rule. He's engaged, uh, he administrates the country quite well, and actually in Stratford and Lord he has two talented um, and efficient and effective uh, uh, administrators of the country as well, people who implement those policies well. Now by 1637, Actually, things on some bases can look quite good. Uh, there was peace in the country uh, and England was at peace. Uh, there were no wars that were being fought. Um, the king was solvent. He had enough money to live off um, and uh, the king was healthy and had an heir. And so in many ways, you could look at this period and say, oh, this uh, personal rule is uh, a period where um, things are going pretty well. But, of course, as historians, we see this period in context and we understand that the problems that had been around in the 1620s uh, and, of course, come to the, massively to the fore in the 1640s are still there and bubbling away and getting worse. So we're going to look at uh, those three now. We're going to look, first of all, at money uh, and then at religion and, of course, finally, uh, at the problems in Scotland. So firstly, at money. Well, the issue for Charles is that through the 1630s, he had to raise enough money to live off. He couldn't do that in an, uh, an overtly illegal way because he needed to keep the country on board. He's helped in this by uh, reaching peace deals, firstly with France in 1629 and then with Spain in 1630. And actually, um, his peace with uh, the Spanish in 1630 also returned the Palatinate to Frederick, uh, which you might remember had been the start of the whole um, problem for James and Charles uh, in 1618. Um, the second thing to note just at the start of this is that his uh, Charles's money policies were run uh, through the 1630s by the Lord Treasurer, Richard Weston. Um, and unfortunately um, for PR, uh, Richard Weston was a Catholic and he is a num one of a number of uh, Catholic or seeming Catholic um, uh, ministers and advisors that Charles has, uh, which kind of um, serve to increase the idea that Charles is um, moving towards Catholicism. Uh, Richard Weston faced a problem, of course, and that was to, to increase uh, the collection of money. Um, he could have cut spending, but he was um, reluctant to put people offside. And uh, as an example of that, he could have cut spending in the royal household. In fact, it's estimated that he could have saved probably £80,000 a year, which is a big amount uh, in those days, simply by just making enough food uh, as the royal family could eat. It's estimated that the budget for the royal family could have fed almost 2,000 people a day. Um, but uh, instead, uh, Richard Weston found ways um, to try and increase uh, spending. Now, there are three main ways we could look at there. The first one is called fiscal feudalism. And this was the idea of bringing back or uh, resurrecting uh, old uh, sort of medieval schemes that the, the crown had available to it for making, uh, for raising money. These were quite unpopular because they seemed a little bit arbitrary uh, and they seemed um, quite anachronistic that they were they were old fashioned. Examples of those you probably have heard of distraint of knighthood. This was the idea that every um, every man who earned over 40 pounds a year should have come to Charles I's coronation to be knighted. Now, they, they hadn't. Um, and so uh, they were now fined as a result. Oliver Cromwell was fined £10 as part of this. Um, and it was quite a, uh, an effective way of raising money. But of course, it annoyed those people who were fined. Also, it's just a one off fine. And so um, it has a limited amount of money, a finite amount of money that can be gained through it. Um, secondly, they uh, they redefined the boundaries of the royal forests uh, and they set them basically to their maximum level. 
um, back to the level of Henry II, sort of 300 years earlier, uh, more than that, 400 years earlier, 500 years earlier. Um, uh, and uh, the idea of this was that anyone then who had built in, in uh, territory which now was defined as, as the Royal Forest, hadn't been defined as the Royal Forest when they built, but now was, they could also be fined um, and, uh, and money could be gained out of that. Or if they were farming that land, again, money could be um, taken from them for that. Again, that's quite unpopular because it's one of those uh, examples where the goalposts have been shifted. Um, other examples of this were gentry who were staying in London without permission or uh, were caught eating meat in Lent. Um, they could be fined as well. And just on the whole, I mean, this is fairly effective. It brought in quite a few different small pots of money, but um, it, it did annoy people. And so this is one of the ways in which Charles is both successful and also um, a bit of a failure. Second big way that there is money is through monopolies. Now, in 1624, um, Parliament had passed a law saying that uh, the, the use of monopolies was uh, was a bad thing and that no longer could individuals um, acquire a monopoly to uh, trade in a particular thing or in a particular place. However, Charles gets round this by um, uh, allowing uh, corporations, uh, companies effectively, to gain monopolies. Um, and so uh, he raises quite a lot of money out of this. It's estimated that out of every £750,000 that was um, gained by the corporations through their monopolies, um, Charles earned 100000 So out of every £750,000 they earned, Charles had earned 100000 And the, the best example of this, of course, is um, uh, soap. Uh, and uh, it's an infamous example because several members of the soap corporation were Catholic, uh, which also annoyed people. Um, they admit the fact that, that only this corporation could provide soap to England meant that the quality of soap apparently went down, the price of soap went up, the crown gained £29,000 a year by 1636 through this um, soap monopoly. So this is, again, quite effective, but again, quite unpopular. And the third way uh, in which they literally raised money was through ship money. Now, ship money was uh, was legitimate and um, people paid it in 1634. It was brought back in to the South Coast. And the idea was that um, the South Coast counties were asked to contribute money to the building of a navy, uh, which would uh, protect the South Coast against um, foreign no, piratical incursions, people that would come and raid towns or perhaps snatch uh, young people to take them off into slavery. That was paid. In 1635, though controversially, it was applied to the whole country, even those counties that uh, were nowhere near the coast. Um, however, it was quite popular, and uh, not popular, it was quite successful. Um, by 1637, £190,000 a year was being collected and non-payment was only 2.5%. It was in fact the most successful tax ever. However, um, its legality was challenged by John Hampton in a, in a famous legal case, the Hampton case, Hampton's H-A-M-P-D-E-N. And, and in that case, uh, Charles actually won the case, uh, but Five of the 12 judges did back Hampton and say this is not really legal. Uh, because of that and because of other issues that were bubbling up in 1638, um, the, the amount collected dropped by 20%. And in 1639, partly because Charles was also raising a militia tax and um, there were other issues going on, payment actually dropped to 20%. In other words, 80% of people were no longer paying it. So ship money, again, starts out really successfully, but by 1639, and um, that had fallen apart as well. And that was, again, a sign of its unpopularity. So successful but unpopular would be my summing up of the whole money issue. Secondly, um, Charles's uh, religious reforms. Now, uh, William Lord became Archbishop of Canterbury in 1633. He was an Arminian, and I said before that the Arminians thought that there were a lot of things that could be learned and borrowed and uh, um, absorbed from Catholicism. However, they were not Catholic, and it's very, very important to, to remember. If you said to William Lord, um, you're a Catholic, he would be appalled by that suggestion. However, he does want uh, kind of a more Catholic and certainly less Puritan um, form of Anglicanism, uh, form of worship, form of Christian worship within England. 
This was unpopular, uh, quite a lot of grumbling probably happened in England. There weren't revolts or riots against it, but uh, like I say, grumbling, probably because people felt that the goals had been shifted, that they'd been believing something, they still believed it, and it had been all right 10 years ago, two years ago even, and now William Lord was coming and saying, no, you must do things in a different way and you must believe slightly different things. Examples of this were uh, that he replaced sermons with what's called catechism, which is quite a Catholic way of doing things, which is basically kind of questions and answers that you have to learn. He closed down the, the so-called fear fees for impositions, who, which were a group that were putting Puritan clergy into empty churches, churches that hadn't got uh, a, a priest or a, or a local uh, minister. They were installing people that, that they wanted in there, which well, was providing um, religious, obviously, uh, religious services for the people in the local area. And better examples are that he brought the prayer book in, which gave a script to ministers, kind of controlled what was being said in churches around the country. Um, he made uh, people bow when the name of Jesus was used uh, in services. Um, and he made sure that ministers wore robes uh, when they were leading services. The robe is called a surplus, if you want to get the technical word. All three of those things were actually Elizabethan practices and he was just restoring them. But he also went further. He put the altar in the east end of the church uh, where the sun would rise. Um, he brought in, um, uh, it, they made a rail, uh, like a sort of um, little fence, I guess, around the altar area. So that the minister stood on one side and, and the people stood on the other. And this made it seem like the people were having to come to the minister who would then mediate between them and God, which is quite a Catholic imposition. Now, he defended this by saying it, it creates a sort of sense of respect uh, and, of, and of worship that you're coming towards God. And it stops dogs running around the church and getting onto the altar and things, which is happening in some places. However, it looked Catholic uh, and, um, and people were uh, grumpy about that. He also brought in stained glass and organs wherever he could. Now, there was protest against this too, and the most famous example of this in 1637 uh, were the protests of uh, Henry Burton, a member of the clergy, um, John Bastwick, who was a doctor, and William Prynne, who was a lawyer. And all three of these men um, had written things or said things against uh, Lord's reforms. And they were brought to the prerogative courts where they were fined. Um, and of course, famously, um, a couple of them had yeah, their ears uh, trimmed or cut off um, as, as a punishment. Now that was seen as being quite an outrage and a lot of people were upset about this. Um, actually, I think as time's getting on, we're going to do Scotland uh, perhaps in the, in the next episode. But just to summarise here, as so far as we've got, the things I would say is that the personal rule was successful, but uh, it was unpopular because people had no outlet um, for their, uh, for their uh, grumbles about what the king was up to, but also because the things that he were doing seemed quite arbitrary and quite um, uh, quite insensitive to the way people felt uh, and, and had acted before. Thanks so much. See you next time.